Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Police officer on the city's yesterday, excuse me, on the city yesterday, at a city officer yesterday was shot. He has a, the suspect has a re history of repeated probation violations and criminal charges, including choking a family member. We're talking about this guy. Bear County records show he has been in trouble nearly every year in the last decade, but he has spent just over a year in state prisons and substance abuse treatment centers. Bear County records show he has five domestic violence charges, six drug related charges against him, many of them dismissed. Court records show that Rubio has only been convicted three times for felony retaliation, misdemeanor and felony drug possession. He is now charged with attempted capital murder of a police officer, violation of a protective order and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus says this guy is not the only repeat offender on San Antonio streets. This isn't a one off. There's plenty of other cases out there like this. Inevitably, when we have a high profile violent felony, we'll run the guy's name and inevitably he'll come back with a, with a number of dismissals, uh, uh, a number of rearrests while he's still on probation. Dominic Rubio currently at the Bear County Jail remanded without bond. Just within the last 30 minutes, District Attorney Joe Gonzalez released a statement on yesterday's shooting. The DA says in part, quote, over 30 days had passed since the original warrant seeking Dominic Rubio's arrest and detention had been issued. Nearly a week had gone by since SAPD had issued a second warrant for Rubio. Rubio should have been in jail long before yesterday's shooting, and it was the SAPD's job to search for him, serve the warrant, and get him there. End quote. We've been working to get answers or solutions from our elected officials about taking criminals off our streets. But someone staying quiet on these issues is Bear County Judge Peter Sakai for some reason. Our RJ Mark has waited for hours today to speak with the judge. He joins us from the Bear County Courthouse. Well, it's been a very frustrating day for our crew here at the Bear County Courthouse. We waited for hours just to speak to Judge Peter Sakai about these ongoing issues, criminals on the streets, and unfortunately, we just didn't get anything. We arrived here at the Bear County Courthouse at 1030 this morning for Commissioner's Court, waited until 3 in hopes of getting anything from Judge Sakai, but he did not want to talk to us on camera. We wanted to ask Judge Sakai about Mayor Ron Nuremberg's comments to us about the recent wave of officer-involved shootings and ways to keep repeat offenders in jail. The mayor said that he's talked with Judge Sakai about possible solutions, but even though the judge did not want to talk to us, his spokesperson did confirm that he has had a phone conversation with the mayor to discuss these problems. But again, Judge Sakai not commenting any further on the matter. We also asked whether he's spoken to the district attorney about the about these issues, and the judge's spokesperson said that he did not know if those talks have taken place with the DA, Joan Gonzalez, or whether the judge has any authority over the district attorney's office. So we were told that there will be a series of community conversations that are open for the public that Peter Sakai will be at and we are hoping that we get some answers from the judge there because that will be an opportunity for people to ask questions and comment on ongoing issues throughout the entire community. Reporting from the Bear County Courthouse, RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Continue trying to get an answer from Judge Peter Sakai on his thoughts about what's happening. Well, tonight a man is dead and a teenager is injured after shooting outside of an apartment complex. That shooting happened after eight last night in the 2500 block of South General McMullen, not far from Kennedy Park. SAPD says a witness told officers two vehicles were facing each other at the entrance to the complex. Then all of a sudden the people inside those vehicles shot at each other. According to SAPD, a man shot in the chest. He died at the hospital. We're also told a 16 year old boy was taken to the nearby hospital. No word on his condition. Officers say the suspects drove off in a white sedan. They have not been found. Tonight, San Antonio police also investigating after a couple kidnapped from their home by gunmen. Happened just after six this morning in the 3100 block of Mission Bell Street. It's not far from Loop 410 and Highway 16 on the southwest side. According to police, two men kicked in a door to a home and took the couple living there with their five children. Officers say the suspects drove off in a white SUV. The suspects or the parents haven't been found yet. I've never once been offered anything ex in exchange for falsifying my public testimony to government entities. 
Neighbors Insurance accusing a developer of offering free home services in exchange for their support on a controversial housing project. Abbey Land LLC spent nearly a year trying to get approval to build a duplex on what was once a golf course. Last night, Shirt City Council was supposed to vote on that idea, but when our Daniela Ibarra started asking questions, the developer refused to answer. Instead, it pulled its plans. Just off Country Club Boulevard in Shirts sits a 25-acre lot of grass. The developer, Obbyland LLC, hoped to build 70 duplexes on it. City Council meetings last month show 166 property owners opposed the plan. Among them was Phil Jackson. The multifamily is not the issue. The issue is not following our development code. Jackson says this video taken in late July by a neighbor exposes an even bigger issue with the developer. Yeah, I represent the, the developer and I just wanted to visit with you all. We are not identifying this man because he has not been charged with any crime. On the recording, he says he wanted to talk with the neighbor because they're against the duplex project. We understand we're gonna have an impact on your house, uh, you know, in particular, or these homes in particular. And so as part of that, we'd be willing uh, to repaint your house when we're doing our painting. And if that's not something of interest, then we could also you know, do some landscaping uh, as well. The representative for the developer tells this neighbor the work is valued at around $3,000. But to get it done, there's a catch. For, for our deal to go forward, we, just, we need a couple of folks to withdraw our opposition, on, and that's what we're going to visit with you all about. Have somebody from the outside come in and do something that, for me, is unethical. That neighbor isn't alone. I a different neighbor told yes. Shirt City Council on Tuesday she had a similar conversation with the same Thank representative. You. I also don't think the offers he made to me were appropriate. At that same oh, meeting, God. council members were supposed to vote on the developer's plan, but that didn't happen. And Hours and before and Tuesday's and meeting, we called the representative for Abbey Land LLC to, to get answers. So we just wanted to be fair and reach out to you and see what you had to say about those allegations. Uh, Less than an hour after our call, the city of Shirts says Abbey Land LLC pulled its zoning application. Shirts Mayor Ralph Gutierrez told KSAT he found out about the application withdrawal 10 minutes before last night's city council meeting. Gutierrez says he's, quote, not too happy with the applicant's behavior. And on Wednesday, we tried to talk with a representative about why Obbyland LLC pulled out last minute. Before we even got a chance to get to his office, we were kicked out. Daniela Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. As for what happens with that property now, it's still very much up in the air. Mayor Gutierrez tells us this is the third zoning issue with that particular property. Tonight, a federal judge ordering the state to move the floating barrier in the Rio Grande, and they are only getting a few days to do it. The judge's ruling states that the barrier must be moved to the Texas side of the river by September 15th. That's just nine days from now. That includes the buoys, the anchors, and other material that make up that barrier. This comes after the U.S. Justice Department filed a lawsuit against Texas and Governor Greg Abbott in July, the same month those buoys were deployed. Just minutes after the federal judge's ruling came down, Governor Abbott's office releasing a statement saying in part, quote, Texas will appeal today's court decision, merely prolonging President Biden's willful refusal to acknowledge that Texas is rightfully stepping up to do the job that he should have been doing all along. This ruling is incorrect and will be overturned on appeal. A former top official for State Attorney General Ken Paxton testifying in his impeachment trial today. While on the stand, former First Assistant Attorney General for Paxton defended his decision to accuse Paxton of wrongdoing. Jeff Mateer spoke about Paxton's relationship with controversial political donor Nate Paul. That's him on the right. And his alleged affair, Paxton's. He went on to say that he determined Paxton was intervening in Paul's legal problems. But Paxton's attorneys questioned Mateer's loyalties and his motivation. That I, I again asked him, and this wasn't the first time, but Ken, why are we involved in this? Is it possible, Mr. Mateer, that you jumped to a lot of conclusions really fast? I don't believe so, sir. And you could have, you could have put all this to bed if you had just talked to your boss. The Paxton's attorneys also accused Mateer of staging a coup in the AG's office. He claims he acted in good faith and thought Paul 
was actually blackmailing the attorney general. A man who appears to have taken the law into his own hands is on trial for murder this week. Gain Pettis is accused of fatally shooting his mother's boyfriend last year. Eric Hernandez was there as the state presented its case. On August 20th last year, 39-year-old Luis Rosales was fatally shot down the road from where his girlfriend lived on La Manda Boulevard. The man who was arrested for his murder, his girlfriend's son, Gain Perez. Perez now on trial for first-degree murder. There was two vehicles in the middle of the roadway. Um, it looked like they had been in an accident. Um, I saw uh, several spent shell casings around the victim and around the uh, around the uh, vehicles. Responding SAPD officer Sergeant Edward Oliva says as he approached the scene, EMS was giving CPR to Rosales in the middle of the street near his truck that looked to have been hit by Perez's vehicle. The truck that's parked, that's the, uh, the victim's uh, vehicle and uh, it, it was blocked in by the defendant's vehicle. The defense in this case implying that Perez was defending his sister who allegedly had been sexually assaulted by Rosales. Is it okay for a child molester to go to the house where the victim resides? Uh, no, it's not. The state is still presenting witnesses, but could rest as early as tomorrow. Then the defense will take over the case, and we will find out if they have enough evidence to prove that Perez was justified in shooting Rosales. If found guilty, Perez is facing up to life in prison. At the Cadena Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, Case at 12 News. All right, let's take a live look outside with weather right now. 101 degrees. We need this to break. You know, I do think it's going to break in the days ahead. We do see a shift in our weather pattern coming by Sunday and into next week. 70, 100 degree days so far this year. We hit 102 today, which ties the record for the day. Much of Texas in triple digits. A good chunk of our state still seeing the century mark for high temperatures. Del Rio 103, Kerrville 100, Catula topped out at 103. We'll talk about our temperature trend, how much temperatures are going to take a hit as our weather pattern shifts, and more importantly, the rain chances with that shift in a bit. Thank you, Adam. Check out traffic right now. We're going to take you to Highway 90 at Lackland, where you can see things are moving on quite smoothly. No major traffic troubles to tell you about at this hour. San Antonio voters approved funding for a downtown bike lane only to have some of the work torn out and redone. Internal records obtained by KSAT investigates spell out a dispute between the city and the church that's nearby over the protected bike lane that runs in front of the sanctuary. Leaders of First Presbyterian Church tell us the project severely limited access to the building and wasn't communicated properly. The city disagrees. It's one of those things, I guess, until you actually saw the actual project being constructed, you, you couldn't tell the impact. In just a few minutes, a closer look at the dust up and whether the voter funded bike lane is actually being used by bicyclists. We still head on the news at six this month is suicide awareness month and after the break, how the Department of Veterans Affairs is trying to make it easier for former service members to get help with their mental health. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on The Night Beat. We've all gotten the message from CPS Energy, conserve your energy. But here's the question, what happens if you don't? Tonight on The Night Beat, we're going to explore that very question. Also, catalytic converter thefts are really nothing new, but unfortunately, a local nonprofit organization has been targeted a few times. Tonight, how those recent thefts are hurting the very people the nonprofit is trying to help. We'll see you for these stories and so much more tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. Up. September Suicide Prevention Month, and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs is taking steps to encourage veterans to seek support if they're struggling with their mental health. The National Veterans Suicide Prevention Annual Report revealing a troubling increase in the suicide rate among our veterans. Dr. Matthew Miller, Executive Director of Suicide Prevention for the VA, says it's critical to spread the word that suicide is preventable. Outside of diagnosis and disorders, Miller says day-to-day -day life, like relationships, financial pressures, and occupational concerns can sometimes just be too much for some. 
It's important to know then veterans uh, can reach out when they're experiencing these very common issues. They don't need to be embarrassed. They don't need to be ashamed. And they're not going to take resources from other veterans by reaching out. The VA's launched a new PSA for their ongoing campaign. Don't wait, reach out. Where vets who feel they're struggling are encouraged to visit. You can learn more about this resource by heading over to ksat.com. Meanwhile, we just continue to pile up record heat. I mean, we're just continuing this n number of 100 degree day record. Adam. And, well, if there was any kind of record this summer, we broke it basically. Yeah. Hottest, hottest summer on record, hottest month ever, which was August. Um, more, most amount of 100 degree days, most consecutive 100 degree days, warmest mornings, most number of 80 degree mornings. <laughs> Should we go on? No. no, let's look to the future. <laughs> Record challenging heat still for the next four days and then changes coming next week. And we still have tropical storm, well, not tropical storm, excuse me, Hurricane Lee. I need to update that Hurricane Lee out in the Atlantic. All right, let's get right to it with our temperature trend. Notice 103 tomorrow then up to 104 by Friday, still 103 Saturday and then low 100s on Sunday. Next four days we are expecting to meet or exceed the record highs for those days. We see that little temperature drop into next week. We still have the upper level high parked over West Texas and Southern New Mexico, still firmly in control of our weather. But that's what changes as we get into Sunday and next week. And this high breaks down as it shifts westward, might even tap into some energy from the Pacific Ocean, some upper level energy. And with this northwesterly flow aloft, the steering flow in the atmosphere, it opens the door for some energy, disturbances, and even a weak cold front to head our way. Don't get too excited when you hear cold front. It's that little temperature drop and just an additional chance for rain. But it does give us that shot at showers and thunderstorms. And notice the rainfall potential map. And this is a generalized estimate of the potential. But finally, we're seeing the rainfall potential back into the Lone Star State, even in our neck of the woods. The darker colors indicate the higher rainfall potential. We're still not going crazy with the chances yet. 20% Sunday and Monday, 30% Tuesday and Wednesday. This, however, does come with the chance of us really raising one of these days, Tuesday or Wednesday, to higher chances. We need more time. We need more information. Stay tuned for some updates. Now let's talk about Hurricane Lee that we have out in the Atlantic. This is a quickly strengthening hurricane category one right now max sustained winds of 75 miles per hour just outside the eye of the hurricane but as it tracks to the northwest over the next few days this is going to be a major hurricane and likely a category four by friday night and early saturday morning notice between bermuda and puerto rico as a cat for 145 mile per hour winds by monday afternoon of next week Right now, the indications are that it would favor this to then be arced northward and parallel the U.S. coast, probably getting steered away. But there's some uncertainty, of course, in those extended longer range forecasts. 100 right now, dew point is 63, feels like 102. Hondo at even 100. Rio Medina now 99. 102 Stinson. This is the typical evening heat we've become accustomed to all summer and now as we've jumped into meteorological fall. This evening, 94 at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, we're at 90. Southeasterly wind at 10 to 15. Not as strong of a sea breeze this evening, but still it's going to boost the humidity and it's going to be very sticky tonight and to start the day tomorrow. 79 at 7 a.m. by noon, we make it to 93 degrees and a high temperature, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 103 for the high temperature with a lot of sunshine tomorrow. Low 100s pretty much for everybody. Timberwood Park 101, Lackland on the west side, Alamo Ranch area 103, Seguin 103, and Elmendorf 104. 99 by Monday, mid 90s on Tuesday, Wednesday. But as I said before, with the potential of raising some of those rain chances Tuesday, Wednesday for at least one of those days, if we do that, temperatures will probably drop a little bit more. I like that. I like that trade off. Yep. Good trade. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right. UTSA taking on Texas State is always a rivalry, but 
It's a little, got a little spicy now thanks to Texas State beating Baylor this weekend. Absolutely. I was just thinking that right now. I don't remember this much hype really leading into yeah. this I-35 rivalry because UTSA in one hand is super upset about their loss, so you know they want to bounce back against Texas State. And speaking of Texas State, we went up there and talked to some area football players who play for the Bobcats to get their thought on this rivalry coming up. I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised at all. Texas State is a very good team. They got a, uh, uh, you know, revamp roster, revamp coaching staff. So I've had their eyes on them um, since the off season. You know, um, so yeah, I wasn't surprised at all. It's a good team. Um, they they went and proved that playing against Bla playing against Baylor, um, Big Twelve team. You know, uh, I think it's been a minute since Texas State has done that. So I think they've proven themselves. I'm going. UTSA football has nothing but respect for Texas State and big board sports. Jeff Trailer and his UTSA Roadrunners are looking to bounce back from their 17-14 week one loss at the Houston Cougars. Coach told the media the team feels miserable and they expect to win every game. Up next, the Texas State Bobcats at the Alamo Dome. UTSA is 4-0 lifetime against the Bobcats. The last time they met was September of 2020 when UTSA won in San Marcos 51-48 in double overtime. Now the Bobcats come to town with a lot of confidence. Yeah, I mean, um, every game's a big game, but you know, Texas State's a little bit different. You know, it's, it's a trophy game, so, you know, we always, we obviously want to keep that trophy here in uh, San Antonio. So, you know, there's a little extra edge for this week, for given that it's Texas State, but um, yeah, I feel like we're ready. No, I just, just stand, stand focused, you know, it doesn't really change how I look at them. Um, I just feel like we, we um, got to still be detailed, still go out and execute, play the game of football. And how about this? Local philanthropist Harvey E. Najem has committed $2 million to the UTSA football program. In addition, he's purchased more than 7,100 tickets for over 60 organizations in San Antonio and surrounding areas to enjoy the home opener on Saturday. And of course, that game is against G.J. Kinney and his Texas State Bobcats, who are coming off a huge 42-31 upset win at the Baylor Bears. The Bobcats were 27.5 point underdogs in Waco, and here they are, 1-0, heading into the I-35 rivalry. That's their first First win over a Power 5 program ever, but obviously it's time to move on. The newest member of our sports team, Nick Mantis, went out to San Marcos to hang out with the Bobcats, and he learned how some local football players are feeling about this weekend's matchup. Hey guys, yeah, here at Texas State, there's a lot of excitement obviously going into this game, coming off a huge win against Baylor. But for the guys who are local to the San Antonio area, playing against UTSA and in an iconic stadium like the Alamo Dome, this game means just a little bit more. Compared to most games, I say this one, do have a little more of a chip on my shoulder and just sticking, just sticking to the plan, just execution, execution, and just making sure I'm doing the little details right. It's pretty exciting. I haven't played back in home since like 2018, since I graduated. So, and we played in the Dome 2015, my freshman year in high school. So, it's going to be a real exciting uh, environment just to head back and play back in the Dome and see the crowd and all my coaches and family and friends I know that's from San Antonio just to come to the game. All right, so a 2.30 kickoff. We're going to see not just how our local San Antonio kids are going to do in this game, but also how this rivalry shapes up for all our local fans in the area. For KSAT 12 Sports, Nick Mantis, back to you guys. Thank you, Nick. Here's the matchup. Texas State, UTSA, Saturday, 2.30 p.m. at the Dome. UTSA is favored by 13, and it's the Let's Go 210 Blue Out game as well. Wow. Pumped up. A lot on the line, Seth. <laughs> exactly. I love that this rivalry is what it is. Yes, and I just hope it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Me too. Yeah. Keep beating the Bailers of the world. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back after the break.